Yeah, so I'm Megan Street. Um, thank you all so much for having me. Um, I'm here in Dallas, so I just drove over this morning. Um, I actually took this course when I studied for boards and um, actually remember feeling really well prepared going into boards and probably more importantly, actually felt pretty confident coming out of boards. Um, so we're going to talk about ER stuff this morning and um, hopefully you guys will feel confident to be able to answer these questions when they pop up on your boards. Um, we have about two hours and 15 minutes or so together this morning, and this is what we're going to go through. Um, the first half of our talk are poisonings and ingestions. Um, toxicology isn't always everybody's favorite subject. <laughs> um, I remember you know, it kind of not being um, my favorite when I studied for peds boards um, and even feeling a little overwhelmed when I took it, um, when I took PEM boards. So I really tried to like condense this down for you guys um, into like the really important stuff, um, give you ways to try and remember this stuff. Um, I'll give you some pearls and hopefully offer you some suggestions of how you may see this on their boards, um, how they may ask you these questions so it doesn't feel quite so overwhelming. Um, we'll take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll talk about some bites and stings and then finish up with injuries, which is stuff you guys are probably a lot more familiar with. So when we talk about toxicology, this is kind of how we're going to break it down. We're going to talk first about the general approach. Um, how do you evaluate and treat a kid that comes in with an unknown ingestion? What are some hints from the history and the physical and, the, um, and some labs that you can do that may clue you in as to what, um, what toxin you may be dealing with? Then we'll talk about some specific pharmaceutical ingestions and then finish up talking about some specific environmental ingestions and exposures. So we're going to start the morning with a question and kind of wake you guys up a little bit. Um, so here's question number one. Medical control calls to tell you that they are bringing in five patients from five different scenes, all with histories of ingestions. Each patient is less than four years old, all have ingestions that have occurred in the last 15 minutes, and all are considered significant amounts. You have one dose of activated charcoal, so which patient gets it? Is it patient A with the acetaminophen overdose? B, the patient with the diltaizin overdose, C, the lithium overdose, D, the multivitamin with iron overdose, or E, the methadone overdose. Okay. Um, this is such a typical question on the boards because it makes you know like 15 different things to answer one question. So the correct answer for this one is the diltaizin overdose. The reason is that acetaminophen um, has a specific therapy. Acetaminophen has an antidote, if you will, in N-acetylcysteine. So if you have one dose of charcoal, you're not going to give it to the patient that has um, an antidote available. Lithium and multivitamin with iron are both incorrect because charcoal does not bind well to elements and chemicals. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, methadone is actually incorrect for the same reason that acetaminophen is incorrect. There's actually an antidote of sorts for opiate overdoses in uh, naloxone. So the answer is B, diltaizin, um, which is a calcium channel blocker, um, causes profound hypotension and bradycardia, um, and is actually on the list of what we call the one pill kill list, um, which we'll talk about. All right, so why do the boards care about toxicology and why are we interested in this? Um, it's because kids get poisoned, and kids get poisoned at a disproportionate um, amount than adults do. And part of the reason is this. Um, I don't even know if many of us could look at these pictures and discern which ones are medication and which ones are candy. Um, it's some times really difficult to look and tell. Um, in 2016, across 55 U.S. poison centers in the nation, there were over 2 million phone calls regarding poisonings and ingestions. That's about one poisoning every 15 seconds. 46% of those were in kids less than six, and there's another 7 to 8% that are teenagers. So we're talking over 50% are kids. The peak frequency occurs in one and two-year-olds, 
Um, poisoning in teens tends to be more serious, often because they're intentional. There's a greater proportion of males to females, um, and there's a greater proportion of males, particularly in children less than 13. However, females, it tends to be um, a common um, method of suicide attempt for teenage girls. The most common ingestions um, in pediatrics, and we mean sort of the younger kids here, are just household, household items. So cosmetics, cleaning substances, um, analgesics primarily just because of how common they are in the home. Foreign bodies, like non-food things, um, like Legos and beads and things like that. Um, and then all the other medications are actually less common. Um, plants are on the list. One of my actually very favorite EMS calls that we ever got in the ER um, was a two-year-old who'd like chewed on a house plant and mom called EMS and the kid comes rolling into the ER. There's this two-year-old on a stretcher with like a seven-foot house plant on the stretcher with him um, because apparently I'm supposed to be able to identify house plants or something. I don't know. Kid was fine. Um, then adolescents, um, these kids tend to um, overdose on their own medications. These are kids who have a history of anxiety or depression, um, so they overdose on analgesics, but then their own sedatives and antipsychotics and antidepressants. Poison prevention is so important, and it is such an important um, part of your anticipatory guidance in well child checks. We really need to start discussing safe storage of chemicals and medications at the six-month visit and every visit thereafter. Um, it is uncommon or less common for kids to come in with ingestions who've like climbed up on the counter and climbed up onto the you know third cabinet into the medicine cabinet to get these. When they come in with ingestions, it's because they're just finding them laying around. They find them on counters and on the floor and on your nightstand and in your purse. Um, and so we really need to counsel safe storage of these substances. Um, be particularly mindful when grandparents come to visit or when the kids go to grandparents' house. Grandparents get a little bit out of the practice of um, um, kid-proofing their house a little bit, and so um, grandparents tend to leave these laying around um, more often, and so we tend to see a lot of these um, come in when grandparents have been visiting. Um, Child-proofing caps have actually decreased the mortality of unintentional ingestions by 45%, so that's a great um, example of how advocacy has uh, positively infect affected these um, kids' lives. So when you have a kid who comes in with an unknown ingestion, um, you know, mom comes in and says, I found a pill in their mouth, um, or they were holding a, you know, half-empty bottle of medication, what are some clues in the history that we might be able to get to help uh, us clue in as to what um, this medication may be? Um, so certainly a home search, um, you know, if the kid had a half-empty bottle of meds, um, did they actually dump out half of them behind the couch or under the bed or feed them to their doll or something like that, or did they actually eat them? Um, we always ask that the families bring in the containers with them um, to help identify it, even if they um, are in the habit of mixing pills and containers. And then what we call the medicine cabinet manifest, which is just really as best they're able to and a list of every single medication um, that they have available in the house. Um, when did it happen? So that's helpful in interpreting drug levels and predicting course of symptoms. How did it happen? So what's the route of exposure? And was this an intentional ingestion versus an unintentional ingestion? And how much? Um, we always have to assume the worst case scenario. If they come in with a half bottle empty um, you know, of liquid acetaminophen, we have to assume they drank the whole thing um, and prepare for the worst. But we know that generally speaking, um, kids kind of only gonna take a swallow full. So the little ones, that's five to 10 mLs, the older ones, maybe 10 to 15. 10 to 15. Um, physical exam is incredibly helpful when we're talking about um, ingestions, and there's a lot of things that we can um, get just from the physical exam that can help um, guide us as to where um, we, you know, we may need to go with these. Um, vital signs, heart rate and blood pressure in particular, neurologic status, pupillary findings, breath odor, and then even some particular skin findings. Um, so if y'all like acronyms, and if you learn well this way, y'all are going to be in heaven for about the next 10 minutes. Um, if you don't, um, then maybe if nothing else, this may just help clue you in or give you, um, you know, some ways to try and remember some of these. Um, all of these, except for maybe one or two, um, actually kind of make sense with what they're trying to make you remember. Um, so hopefully that's helpful for you. So, um, 
with heart rate, we have tachycardia, which is fast, and bradycardia, which is paced. So that makes sense, right? So for tachycardia, it's things like free-based cocaine, anticholinergics, so um, Benadryl, TCAs, um, aspirin, sympathomimetics. So those are commonly um, amphetamines. Those are um, like ADHD medications, decongestants, things like that. And then theophylline, which is a bronchodilator. Um, bradycardia, we think about propranolol and other beta blockers, um, anticholinesterase drugs, those are often um, like dementia drugs, uh, clonidine and calcium channel blockers, which are antihypertensives, um, ethanol and digoxin. Um, I could never remember this, so meiosis and midriasis always stress me out. Meiosis is the small word, and it's the small pupil, if that's helpful. Um, the acronym for this one is COPS, um, so cholinergics, clonidine, um, opiates, organophosphates, phenothiazine, and sedatives um, will all cause meiosis, so small word, small pupil. Midriasis, big word, big pupil, if that's helpful. This is one of the few, it makes kind of no sense, AAS. I couldn't find anything or come up with anything more creative than that. Um, antihistamines, anticholinergics, and sympathomimetics, again, like amphetamines, uh, methamphetamines, cocaine, things like that. Some skin findings that you may see, um, diaphoretic skin. So think if you're super sweaty, you need to take a bath, you need soap, the acronym is SOAP. Uh, sympathomimetics organophosphates, um, salicylates, so aspirin salicylates, and PCP. Also red skin, or ABCs, um, anticholinergics um, will make you really flushed. Boric acid is stuff that's found in like roach killer, um, and carbon monoxide. There's that classic cherry red skin or cherry red spot. Um, you actually don't tend to see it as often as you think, but that's a, that's a board question they like to ask. And then classically, um, the met hemoglobinemia. So some things like um, actually trim sulfa. Um, there are some, um, like lidocaine uh, can cause met hemoglobinemia. There are some toxidromes that you really need to know, and there's two in particular. Um, so what a toxidrome is, it's like a cluster of symptoms that are caused by one particular toxin. So if you have a kid that comes in um, and you're able to identify sort of a group of symptoms, it may lead you um, towards a particular um, ingestion or toxin. The anticholinergic one is the one you guys are probably the most familiar with. That's that hot as a hair, blind as a bat, dry as a bone, red as a beet, mad as a hatter, full as a flask. These are mad, agitated, irritated, angry kids. Um, they're tachycardic, they're hypertensive. You can see um, coma and dysrhythmias and seizures. Those are less common, but when you do, um, that is evidence of a more significant ingestion. The other one is the cholinergic toxidrome, so it's literally the opposite of the anticholinergic toxidrome. These are from organophosphate poisonings. This is dumbbells, which you've probably heard before as well. These are leaky, secretion-y, wet kids, so they've got diarrhea, urination, meiosis, emesis, lacrimation, and salivation, but what you really need to remember, we call them the killer bees. So bronchorrhea, which is like pulmonary edema, um, bronchospasm, and then bradycardia. So this is where you get your morbidity from cholinergic toxidromes. So <clears throat> we've talked about history, we've talked about a little bit on the physical exam, some, some clues that you may have. So what testing can you do? Um, you actually can do x-rays. Um, some things show up on x-rays, uh, and the acronym for that is COINS. So you think you're kind of doing an x-ray to, we often see COINS as a foreign body, that's your acronym there. Chloral hydrate and calcium, um, opiate packets that, they, that the teenagers swallow when they're running away from the cops, um, iron or other heavy metals, uh, neuroleptic agents, and then any like sustained release or enteric coated agents, um, and sometimes salicylates as well will show up um, on x-ray. So what testing can you do? Um, what actual labs can you send off that may be of any benefit to you? Well, things like acetaminophen, salicylate, and ethanol actually have specific levels. Um, so you can send those off specifically. Those are also helpful in um, identifying co-ingestions. Um, we want to get EKGs on these kids. Um, a lot of things, particularly TCA ingestions, have some pretty specific um, EKG findings, a pregnancy test on all adolescent females, CBC, a CMP, you're looking really for liver and kidney dysfunction, 
Um, serum osmolality is incredibly important. You want to get um, measured serum osmols from the lab, and we'll talk about that in a second. ABGs to assess acid-base status, a bedside glucose. Um, there are some toxins that will cause hypoglycemia specifically, and then a urine drug screen and a send-off drug screen, um, which um, isn't helpful in real time, but sometimes later making it confirmatory. The diagnosis, differential diagnosis of hypoglycemia is hobbies. Um, it's actually obbies because the H is hypoglycemia. Um, oral hypoglycemic agents, obviously, right, guys? So those are like um, diabetes meds, um, particularly like the sulfonylureas like glipizide and glyburide. Uh, beta blockers, uh, insulin, ethanol is a big one that does this, um, and salicylates. So this is one of these calculations that you kind of just have to put in your brain. Um, this is one that I would suggest you like make a note card of and kind of stare at it the night before and you stare at it the morning of the test and then when you go to take your test, you just kind of regurgitate it back out um, and you know, write it down really quickly and then it's available to you when you need it. So the osmolar gap is helpful in identifying toxic alcohol ingestions. Um, this calculation, again, you really just have to memorize um, the sodium times 2 plus the BUN divided by 2.8 plus the glucose divided by 18. You get your measured osmolar gap from the, or measured osmols from the lab. You subtract your calculated osmols that you get from the equation, and that is your osmolar gap. Anything greater than 10 is suggestive of a toxic alcohol ingestion. The acronym for that is MEDI, because these really are toxic. Um, that's methanol, ethylene glycol, some diuretics like mannitol, sorbitol can do it, um, and then isopropyl alcohol and ethanol are the ones you really think about. The anion gap is one you're probably more familiar with um, and can do this one a little bit easier, um, but that's your sodium minus your chloride plus your bicarb, which also you need to know. Anything greater than 12 is med piles, um, which I know you guys um, have heard this one before. So this is where your med piles comes in. So we've talked about history and physical exam and some toxidromes and some tests you can do, but what do you actually do for these patients when they come into the ER? Um, this is the first of about 700 times today you're going to hear me say ABCs because we do ABCs on probably every patient every time, no matter where you practice, it's ABCs are always first. Um, with toxicology, we add a D, E, F, and G. Um, just to make it a little bit more complicated. Um, D stands for decontamination, and so there's multiple routes of decontamination kind of depending on the exposure. We'll talk about those. Um, there's also don't, which are some sort of specific um, antidotes that you can give um, to treat life-threatening um, conditions in real time. So dextrose for hypoglycemia, oxygen for hypoxemia, um, naloxone for um, a narcotic overdose, and then you think about thiamine too um, in these kids that come in with ethanol poisoning. Um, then we also talk about uh, enhanced elimination. So those are things like alkalinizing the urine, which facilitates secretion. Um, focus therapy, the best example of that would be like N-acetylcysteine um, for an acetaminophen ingestion, and then get tox help. So call poison control, call a toxicology consult. Um, we'll spend about four seconds on this um, because ABCs. Um, so airway breathing circulation comes before everything, regardless of what they took. Um, stabilize the ABCs and then move on. So dermal decontamination, um, you know, kids who come in and have poured um, hydrocarbon on themselves um, or, um, you know, they've been in a fire and they're contaminated with smoke, um, we need to remove clothing, we need to rinse the skin. Ocular decontamination, um, that's sort of putting in a Morgan lens and flushing with either um, lactated reader, ringers or saline, um, and then respiratory decontamination. Um, that's often at the scene, but the best example of that is sort of removing somebody from a carbon monoxide um, exposure and um, flushing that out with uh, oxygen. GI contamination, so the idea behind this is that you know, liquids are absorbed in about 30 minutes. We feel like solids are probably in about one to two hours. Um, so in theory, there's a window of time that we may have um, to, um, to be able to flush some of this out um, and, and decrease uh, bioavailability. Um, there are several options available. Um, really the one that's, that's used in real time um, is charcoal. Um, and the idea behind charcoal is exactly that. So you give the charcoal, it binds up the substance, um, decreases bioavailability, and they um, excrete it without it being absorbed. 
Cathartics are things that um, facilitate defecation. Um, these are really never used alone, only in addition um, to charcoal occasionally. Ipecac is um, a syrup. It actually used to be on the counter, like over the counter, um, um, but it's a medicine that was given to induce vomiting. It is never recommended. That is never the answer on the boards. Um, we don't do that. So if that is an answer on your boards, cross it out. It's wrong. Um, and gastric lavage is sort of pumping the stomach. Um, again, not really used, but the idea is you know, putting in an NG tube, um, flushing some fluids, and then sucking it back out to try and suck the, you know, the, um, the toxin out um, this way before you uh, have a chance to absorb it. So charcoal, um, if we're going to give it, um, the dose is about a gram per kilo up to about 50 to 60 grams max. Um, again, the idea is that it absorbs the substance in the stomach, decreases the bioavailability, and you get rid of it without actually um, um, uh, uh, absorbing any of the, the toxin. Um, it's only ever given in the first hour, um, and so past that, you've passed your window for charcoal administration. Um, so keep that in mind for the boards, too, um, and in real life. Um, there are a handful of situations where it is advantageous after an hour. Um, this is sort of clinically relevant more than anything. Um, if there's delayed gastric emptying um, or particularly extended release substances, um, then it may be advantageous. Other than that, um, outside that hour window, we don't give it. Again, like I said, generally speaking, I, um, chemicals um, and uh, <clears throat> chemicals and elements are not bound well to charcoal. Um, think about things that are on the periodic table, um, potassium, calcium, iron, lithium, those kind of things are not going to bind well to charcoal. Um, it's still recommended by poison control. I would say, generally speaking, it is used less commonly than it was, um, probably because there just have not been a lot of studies that have shown that it is exceptionally helpful. And there's risks um, with charcoal. The primary one is pulmonary aspiration. Um, if you aspirate charcoal into your lungs, um, there is some significant morbidity with that. Um, it causes nausea and vomiting. It causes constipation, um, which is why sometimes we'll give a cathartic with it. Um, and little kids just don't want to drink it. It's nasty. You have a lot of these kids who you know, ate a whole bunch of medicine, and so their stomach doesn't feel good anyway, and then you're trying to get them to drink this activated charcoal on top of it, and they want no part of it. Um, and so it's, it's difficult to administer. Um, Contraindications, so it's anything that would increase your risk for aspiration. So kids with altered mental status never get charcoal um, if, because they're unable to protect their airway. So think they need to be able to fully protect their airway before we would ever give charcoal. Um, we never give charcoal with hydrocarbons or corrosives. Again, um, because of the risk of vomiting, the last thing we want to do is have those hydrocarbons or corrosives come back up um, and re-expose those tissues and or aspirate them um, and then you've just made the situation a whole lot worse. Um, and then obviously any like GI stuff, like bowel obstruction or perforation, um, we're not gonna give charcoal. These are the things that charcoal are ineffective in, but again, I think it's easier just to think about stuff that you might find on um, the periodic table. I think that makes it just a little bit easier. Um, so again, cathartics, we never use these alone, um, only ever with um, activated charcoal in conjunction. Um, sorbitol is the most common one, um, and really there's just not a lot of studies that show that they actually help much. Um, gastric lavage, again, we almost never do these. Um, we're never going to do these in little bitties, like in infants, um, maybe as a last-ditch resort. Like somebody comes in with a significant um, overdose of a particularly toxic agent that there's not a known um, antidote for, you may consider it. But again, they need to be able to protect their airway. Um, and if you're going to do that, you might as well end up just doing charcoal. Um, and so these are just really not done um, routinely. So we've kind of gone through um, sort of the general approach to a lot of these. Um, we're going to talk now about some specific pharmaceutical ingestions. Um, the most common one being acetaminophen, um, and that's probably just because of how common it is in the house. Um, there's about 30,000 reports every year to the poison database for acetaminophen ingestion. It's rapidly absorbed, which is why it's a good drug. It works fast in about you know, 15 minutes. It's metabolized in the liver using an enzyme called glutathione. Um, and in toxicity, what happens is that you run out of glutathione. And so these toxic metabolites accumulate and cause liver damage. 
So you take acetaminophen. Acetaminophen gets converted into this NAPQI, and that is a toxic metabolite. But glutathione, conveniently, converts it into non-toxic metabolite that you can then excrete. So in overdose, you run out of your glutathione. You use all your glutathione up, and so this NAPQI builds up in your liver and causes um, necrosis. So the therapy is N-acetylcysteine, and what N-acetylcysteine does is it just replaces your glutathione. That's it. Um, it replenishes your glutathione so you can continue converting that toxic metabolite to a non-toxic metabolite. An acute toxic dose, a one-time acute toxic dose of acetaminophen is 150 milligrams per kilo or 7.5 grams. You can get acetaminophen toxicity from repeated super therapeutic doses, like if the parents are giving just a little bit too much over and over and over again, you can see toxicity. Um, there is a pretty predictable timeline that we will see um, with acetaminophen ingestion. Zero to 24 hours, um, they may be asymptomatic, they may have a little bit of nausea and vomiting, but their labs are still normal. You've got normal LFTs. 24 to 72 hours is this kind of latent period, may have a little bit of right upper quadrant pain, um, but your, or your transaminases and your coags start to bump. 72 to 96 hours is really the peak of symptoms. Um, your transaminases are through the roof, greater than 20,000. Often um, you start to see coagulopathy, um, and this is when you can um, have death from either or liver failure or coagulopathy. Four to 14 days is recovery um, or not. So this is what you need to know for your test. This is kind of the important question. Um, the most important lab with acetaminophen ingestion is the four-hour level. Anything before that is not helpful. Um, you need a level at four hours from the last dose. Um, you know, this is if you're expected to develop hepatic toxicity. I would argue that you really have no idea yet if you don't have the lab and who's going to develop hepatic toxicity. So we would get um, liver function tests, coags, um, uh, a BMP, and then you know you always want to screen for co-ingestions. So this is what you do with that four-hour um, acetaminophen level: is you plug it into this Remac Matthew nomogram. Um, anything below the level, um, you are generally safe and are at very low risk for hepatic toxicity. Sixty percent of patients that are above this level are going to go on to develop some degree of hepatic toxicity. For acetaminophen ingestion, um, ABCs, um, obviously evaluate and treat for co-ingestions. Um, charcoal, if it's appropriate, so if it's within the first hour, their airway is protected, their mental status is intact, but then the treatment is N-acetylcysteine. There's two routes to give N-acetylcysteine, um, and usually we prefer the oral route if we're able to. The funny thing about this one is that you give a loading dose, and then there's 17 subsequent doses every four hours. So you're talking like a minimum of a four-day hospital stay, um, whereas with the IV um, um, method, it's a loading dose over an hour, and they get two subsequent doses. So that tends to make a little bit more sense. All right, next question. Um, a child presents with 250 milligrams per kilo ingestion of acetaminophen three hours prior to presentation. Immediate management should include A, immediate acetaminophen level, B, activated charcoal, C, N-acetylcysteine, or D, induction of emesis. See, y'all are great. You're good. Um, yes, the answer is N-acetylcysteine. So immediate acetaminophen level is not correct because you're only three hours out. You need to wait till four hours to get that first level. Um, activated charcoal is not correct because you are three hours out. You've got to give that within the first hour if it's going to be effective. Um, and induction of emesis is never the answer. So cross that off every time. Um, we're not going to make them throw it back up. Um, so N-acetylcysteine. Salicylate ingestions, not quite as common as they used to be. Um, it's not used for a pain reliever as often as it was, but it is still present in lots of substances. Um, aspirin, oil of wintergreen is what they love to ask about. You see a lot of questions about oil of wintergreen. They'll give you the, the scenario of a kid that smells like mint. Um, and that's oil of wintergreen. Also, it's in some antidiarrheal products. It uncouples oxidative phosphorylation and kicks your respiratory center into overdrive. Um, it is dose-dependent, and so the greater the amount that you ingest, the more symptomatic that you are. 
acute signs and symptoms, nausea and vomiting, but these are the ones, tinnitus, hyperventilation, and respiratory alkalosis um, with an anion gap metabolic acidosis. If they give you that, um, a kid with tinnitus, hyperventilation, respiratory alkalosis, um, anion gap metabolic acidosis, and they smell like mint, that is a salicylate ingestion. You can also have some other nonspecific findings, um, renal failure, hyperthermia, some agitation. Um, mortality is primarily due to pulmonary or cerebral edema, electrolyte imbalance, and cardiovascular collapse. Um, monitoring, this is one that you can get specific levels for, so um, a serum salicylate level that you can track, a blood gas, BMP, coags, um, and if levels remain high, um, aspirin can clump together, those tabs can clump together in your belly, and occasionally a bezoar will form. So if those levels remain persistently high, you may have to ad advocate for um, an endoscopy um, to evaluate for a bezoar. Management, again, largely um, supportive, ABCs, activated charcoal if it's appropriate, fluid, re or fluid hydration, um, and then this is one where you'll want to alkalinize the urine um, with IV bicarb. It enhances um, excretion, it enhances elimination, um, so uh, IV sodium bicarb. You can consider hemodialysis for kids who have encephalopathy, renal failure, pulmonary edema, or refractory acidosis. Ibuprofen ingestion um, doesn't tend to cause a lot of toxicity, probably because the dose that you need um, for actual toxicity is so high, um, over 400 milligrams per kilo. Um, so we just don't tend to see really sick kids from acetamin or from ibuprofen ingestions. Um, some have a little bit of GI upset. Um, if you do, you may see metabolic acidosis, renal failure, polyuria, or coma, um, activated charcoal if it's appropriate, um, but this is largely just um, supportive. There continues to be a rise in opiate ingestions um, in kids as there continues to be a rise in opiate use um, in our country. Most of kids um, find it laying around, so a lot of these are accidental ingestions from what they find in the house. Um, physical findings for this are meiosis, respiratory depression, CNS depression, hypotension. Um, you guys know what these kids look like. They, they are sleepy. They've got tiny pupils. Um, they have a decreased respiratory drive. Management, um, again, largely supportive. ABCs, um, you may have to intubate them if um, their respiratory depression is significant enough. Um, but naloxone. Naloxone is a... Um, reverses um, the symptoms of opiate ingestion. You may have to give repeated doses. So um, the half-life of naloxone in adults is about an hour and a half in kids. The studies were done in actually in neonates. And so for neonates, it's about three hours. Um, for general pediatric patients, it's probably somewhere in between. But if they took a long-acting um, opiate, you may see that you give them the naloxone, they wake up, they look good, and then they start to get sleepy again um, because the half-life of the opiate is longer than the half-life of the naloxone. So keep that in mind. You may have to give repeated doses. Um, again, activated charcoal if it's within the first hour. Um, again, respiratory CNS depression with pinpoint pupils, that is an opiate ingestion. Antihypertensives, um, we see these often as well because they're common medications. Clonidine in particular is dangerous um, because kids are so sensitive. You need like 0.1 milligrams for toxicity in kids. They've got a pretty rapid onset um, within the first hour. Um, it's unlikely to develop new symptoms after four hours, um, and they tend to resolve after about 24 these look real similar to opiate ingestions. Um, they can have apnea, um, hypotension, lethargy, and meiosis. Um, but what the antihypertensives gives you are bradycardia. You usually don't get bradycardia with the opiate ingestions unless it's secondary to respiratory depression. Um, these cause primary bradycardia. And so that is one thing that can clue you in um, as to something that is different than the opiates. Um, sometimes kids will um, find a clonidine patch and think it's a sticker and stick it on. Um, and so certainly if you've got a clinical suspicion, um, look for one of those just in case. Again, you can consider charcoal if it's within the first hour. Um, ABCs, you may have to intubate these kids um, if the respiratory depression is severe. You can try atropine and naloxone for these. They've got some variable effects. 
Um, the other antihypertensives, calcium channel blockers and beta blockers. So remember, guys, these are antihypertensives. Their job is to bring down blood pressure. So they cause hypotension, they cause bradycardia. Um, one of the ways to differentiate the calcium channel blockers from the beta blockers is that with beta blockers, you get hypoglycemia. Your glucose is low. With calcium channel blockers, it's high. Um, treatment, again, ABCs. Um, charcoal, if it's appropriate, calcium for the cal to overcome that calcium channel blockade, um, pressors if they're profoundly hypertensive. Um, glucagon is an antidote for beta blockers, and this was not really one that I ever remembered well until I actually had a kid who came in with this. Um, he was on propranolol for a hemangioma, and parents had gone on vacation. Grandma and grandpa had been taking care of him um, and had probably been giving him repeated super therapeutic doses, um, and he came in profoundly hypotensive bradycardic, hypoglycemic, looked awful. Um, and we gave glucagon, he sat right up. It was the most incredible thing, and I will never forget it. Um, it works like naloxone does. Um, we can treat with high-dose insulin and glucose, um, and then there's even some evidence that um, intralipid or lipid emulsion therapy is helpful. Iron ingestion, I would say it's not one that we probably see um, incredibly often, but when we do, um, these are particularly toxic, um, and they like to ask about these a lot. You'll get some questions and um, some practice questions on these. So um, the source is obviously prenatal vitamins and iron supplementation. Um, the pathologies, it's really just directly damaging to the cell mucosa um, or to the cells themselves. It damages the GI mucosa. The cells um, start leaking. You get fluid shifts, profound hypotension. Um, doses are, um, or I'm sorry, symptoms are dose uh, related. So the higher dose that you ingest, um, the more symptomatic you will become. Phase one uh, is the GI stage. So um, 30 minutes to about six hours, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, abdominal pain. You can see hematochesia and um, hematemesis in severe cases. Um, and again, this is just from direct damage to the GI mucosa. Stage two is the stability phase um, where things kind of tend to level out. Three and four is when things go bad. Um, this is when you really tend to see um, cardiovascular collapse um, from these fluid shifts and these hypotension um, and hepatic failure. And phase five is this sort of scarring phase where um, you get stricture formation um, from all of the trauma. The way that I remember this is iron. Um, so iron ingestion, it's iron. I is the ingestion phase, phase one. Two is R is recovery. Um, phase two, three is like, oh my gosh, things are going really bad um, for three and four. And then stage five is N, which is narrowing or the stricture formation. Um, you're really monitoring for these sort of predicted um, effects, so metabolic acidosis, liver damage, coagulopathy, and anemia, um, and the labs that you get are accordingly. Um, so serum ion concentrations, electrolytes, liver function, um, blood gases, CBC, coags. Um, I would advocate that you type and screen these patients because there's a high risk of bleeding. Um, Abdominal radiographs may confirm these. So remember, this is like the eye in coins. Um, the liquid preps, chewables, um, you're not going to see, um, but the tabs you may. Um, and you want to obtain these serum iron levels um, and track them every four to six hours. Anything greater than 500 is considered um, pretty significant um, toxicity, and so the treatment for that is IV, IV deferoxamine. Um, it just binds up the iron. Um, you will see a Vinrose urine um, because of the iron that is bound up. You excrete it, and your urine changes color. That's that classic Vinrose urine. Um, Consider bowel irrigation or endoscopic pill remover. I guess if there's like a large quantity um, in your stomach, um, that would kind of be um, maybe an indication to sort of pump the stomach if they're available, um, but we, we don't do that very often. Anticholinergic toxicity, so this is back to that anticholinergic toxidrome that we talked about. These are a lot of the sources. Um, diphenhydramine is probably the most common. Um, antipsychotics, TCAs, which are incredibly dangerous and we will talk about shortly. Um, they love to ask about these naturally occurring sources of stuff. So think about jimson weed, deadly nightshade, belladonna, um, and angel trumpet flowers. I have no idea what these things actually are in real life, um, but they are these naturally, naturally occurring sources um, that have some atropine in them. Um, the, the stem that you may see is this kid who's playing down by the railroad tracks, and then he comes back with these like symptoms of, you know, of, of, of anticholinergic toxicity. So those, you may want to think about that jimson weed, belladonna, or angel trumpet flowers. Again, these are mad, agitated, irritated, angry kids. 
Um, supportive care, um, ABCs, again, activated charcoal if it's appropriate. Benzos are helpful for agitation and seizures. Um, if you see some cardiac dysfunction, if you start to see some arrhythmias, that's an indication um, for sodium bicarbonate. Physostigmine will um, inhibit the acetylcholinesterase so that it's not able to break down the acetylcholine. You've got more acetylcholine available, um, and so there is um, some benefit to that. You want to check a CK in these kids. They get rhabdo from how agitated they are, um, but if they're completely asymptomatic after about six hours, you're safe to discharge them. TCAs, um, these, these are nasty. Um, so these show up with... Um, anticholinergic properties um, because of the muscarinic symptoms, but then you also get cardiac toxicity. Um, there's a sodium channel blockade, which is, causes PR and QRS prolongation. There's a potassium channel inhibition, which gives you QTC prolongation, and then you're anticholinergic on top of it. Um, this is an EKG um, that you see uh, with TCA overdoses. Um, so the tachycardia that you see is largely um, sinus tach from the anticholinergic, um, but then you can see some PR prolongation and QRS widening here um, from your sodium channel blockade. Um, one of the ways to remember um, these TC, tricyclic anti antidepressants, three Cs and an A, um, so coma, convulsions, cardiac dysrhythmias, and acidosis. Management, largely supportive. Um, ABCs protect the airway, activated charcoal if it's appropriate. Um, alkalinizing the serum, so IV bicarb, particularly if you're seeing cardiac dysrhythmias, um, that can overcome that sodium channel blockade. Um, treat seizures, uh, benzos, we want to avoid phenytoin in particular, and then you treat their hypotension, um, IV fluid and pressors. This is a list, um, really more for your own kind of knowledge, this kind of one pill kill list that I talked about. This is a list of meds that if there's any concern that maybe this is one of the potential ingestions, if there's you know any thought that this may be one um, on that sort of medicine cabinet manifest, um, you know, these are ones that should um, prompt you to really consider contacting poison control, refer to the emergency department. These are dangerous drugs. Um, so we've talked about some specific medications. Um, there's some side effects of some of these that show some classic side effect profiles that you want to know about. Serotonin syndrome is one of these. Um, serotonin syndrome shows up because you have too much serotonin. So either you start a new serotonin medication, you adjust the dose, um, you add another one in addition, um, and these kids show up within the first 24 hours of a dosage change or a new exposure. Um, they're agitated, um, they're delirious, they're confused, they have like rigidity and clonus, um, autonomic hyperactivity, increased temperature, blood rate, or blood pressure, heart rate, they're diaphoretic. The two things that you need to know about this is that they're hyperreflexic in their lower extremities and it's rapid onset. So this is within 24 hours. The treatment for this is just benzos, benzos and supportive care. That is in contrast to neuroleptic malignant syndrome. This, it's similar, it looks similar. Um, increased temperature, tachycardia, hypertension, rigidity, agitation. The difference with this is that this is a side effect of being on antipsychotic medicines over time. So this develops days to weeks later, and they have bradyreflexia. So serotonin syndrome, they're hyperreflexic, and it develops in 24 hours of a new medication change. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome, bradyreflexic, later onset, and you treat with dantrolene. Methemoglobinemia um, occurs um, when the iron in the hemoglobin is converted to the ferric form from the ferrous form, and then oxygen can't bind to it. Um, there are congenital forms, and there's actually reports of like an entire like family with congenital methemoglobinemia. Um, they're all kind of blue. It's it's funny. Um, uh, but the, what we really uh, you know, deal with in the emergency department, obviously, is the acquired form. So these kids show up with headache, dyspnea, altered metastasis, acidosis. What you need to know is that they have clinical signs of hypoxia. So they have cyanosis, they're blue, um, their pulse ox reads low, it reads 85%, but their PaO2 is normal. Um, and that's sort of the classic hypoxia, but normal PaO2. It's actually diagnosed by coaxim so it's something you can send with your blood gas. You have to request it separately, um, but that's how it's diagnosed, and treatment is methylene blue. 
All right, so we're going to talk about um, now some environmental exposures, um, carbon monoxide being one of the more common and one of the more deadly um, because people don't know they're being poisoned. This is a colorless, odorless gas. Um, carbon monoxide will reversibly bind to one of the binding sites, um, and when you have this new carboxyhemoglobin, now you can't release oxygen to the tissues that need it. Um, so when they would normally release oxygen, they're no longer able to do that, and this takes your whole oxygen disassociation curves and shifts it to the left. <clears throat> These kids um, are, have flu-like symptoms, um, headache, dizziness, nausea, and vomiting. What you need to think about are the kids what, when they all come in together. Um, so a whole family has acute onset of this stuff simultaneously. Um, you need to consider carbon monoxide exposure. Um, there's really few physical exam findings. You talk about that cherry red skin. Um, that's not particularly helpful. Um, Laboratory um, evaluation is a carboxyhemoglobin level. You actually get that on your blood gas. Um, so levels 15 to 20% will produce symptoms. And in these, your PaO2 is normal, but so is your pulse ox. So your pulse ox is not helpful in diagnosing carbon monoxide poisoning. Management is um, washing it out with oxygen. So the half-life for carbon monoxide poisoning uh, or carbon monoxide on room air is about five hours. That goes down to like 60 to 90 minutes on 100% FiO2. So put them on a non-rebreather, flush that out. Um, cardiac monitoring, um, treat any metabolic acidosis. There's some patients who would qualify for hyperbaric therapy. Um, and then certainly identify the cause so they don't go back and re-expose themselves. Caustic ingestions, um, these are your acid and base ingestions. So alkali um, tend to be more problematic. That's stuff in like oven and drain cleaner, hair, relaxer, bleach, um, buzzword, liquefaction, liquefaction necrosis. Those, so these are severe, deep, rapid burns that develop. Um, Acidic ingestions are things like toilet bowl and grout cleaner, rust removal, and this one is coagulation necrosis. Um, the reason that, that um, alkali agents are worse um, than acidic agents are for two reasons. One, the alkali agents don't tend to taste as bad, so kids get more. Um, acidic things are nasty, and they're bitter, and they tend to stop drinking it as soon as they realize that it's gross. Um, but liquefaction necrosis um, is deep and penetrates deep into the tissue very quickly. With acidic ingestions, um, you get this eschar that forms, and so the deep layers are protected. Signs and symptoms, drooling, refusing to drink, um, vomiting, certainly if you see any um, oral or mucosal burns, um, dysphagia, late findings or severe findings, um, strider, respiratory distress, chest or abdominal pain, hypotension, metabolic acidosis, or certainly DIC. Evaluation, um, so no symptoms usually suggest little to no injury. If you've got a kid who's running around the room, um, they are acting totally fine, they have a completely normal exam, they're eating and drinking, they're not vomiting, it is unlikely that they had a significant ingestion. Uh, but remember that just an absence of oral lesions does not mean that they do not have anything more distal. Um, we check labs, um, a chest and abdominal radiograph, um, you know, presumably looking for any free air. Um, we want to remove any contaminated clothing, um, early intubation if they have any signs or symptoms um, of respiratory distress or strider, IV medication um, as opposed to PO. We want to keep these guys in PO. Uh, and we want to consider or advocate for an upper endoscopy, not immediately, um, but 12 to 48 hours later to evaluate damage. Um, steroids are not indicated. Um, do not induce emesis. And again, remember, these are ones where charcoal is contraindicated, so we do not give charcoal for these. Complications, um, necrosis, esophagitis, gastritis, perforation, peritonitis, or late stricture formation. Um, they'll get scarring um, weeks to months later. Laundry detergent pods are a relatively new problem. Um, it's a problem for little bitties because they look like candy. Um, they're shiny and they're bright and they're squishy and they think they look neat and they bite down into them. It's a problem for teenagers because apparently it's a thing on social media um, to do it. this Tide Pod Challenge is a thing um, where they'll eat these intentionally. Um, they're not entirely sure why these are so toxic. Um, it may be because of how concentrated they are, um, but these cause vomiting, um, some mental status changes, but really it's respiratory distress. This calls, these, these cause pulmonary edema. Um, these kids come in with severe respiratory distress, um, largely supportive care. 
hydrocarbon ingestions. So think about these are things you find in your garage. Um, gasoline, lighter fluid, kerosene, solvents. Um, again, the, the stem for this one will look something like the kid was playing in the garage, and then he comes out with you know, respiratory distress. These are hydrocarbons. Um, some of these volatile things, um, the teenagers will huff these. Um, so these are often huffing agents um, because they produce some euphoric uh, effects. Toxicity is due to the fact that they are low viscosity, and so they are high risk for pulmonary aspiration. So that's where these are dangerous. They can cause some cardiac dysrhythmias, and that's where the kids who huff these get into trouble, and they'll have some cardiac dysrhythmias. Clinical findings are respiratory stuff, so coughing, choking, gagging, wheezing. Um, you can get some mild CNS depression or fever from inflammatory. Um, labs are pretty nonspecific. Um, maybe you see a little bit of a, a leukocytosis, but otherwise labs are not helpful. This is what you're looking for, is a chest x-ray. Um, so kids with hydrocarbon ingestions, you want a chest x-ray. Um, this, um, this is chemical pneumonitis, um, and chemical pneumonitis will lead to ARDS. So we want to get a chest x-ray on anybody that's symptomatic at any point. If they're completely asymptomatic, they've got a normal exam, normal vital signs, or satting normally, you can get a chest x-ray at the end like of observation window of about six hours. And if that's completely normal, then you could consider discharging these kids, but this is what you're looking for. Um, remember dermal decontamination. A lot of these times they'll spill the stuff on themselves. Um, but again, you can discharge these kids safely if they're completely normal and have a normal chest x-ray at the end of a six-hour observation period. Um, again, if they're symptomatic at any point, you get a chest x-ray and they get admitted. Um, steroids and prophylactic antibiotics are not particularly helpful. Um, and if they do have cardiac dysrhythmias, remember that their myocardium is sensitized, um, so you really want to try to avoid catecholamines. Um, we do not GI contaminate, decontaminate these patients, so we're not going to do um, charcoal, and um, we're not going to pump their stomach. Um, yeah, maybe super large in ingestions, but um, clinically we really don't do this. Ethanol ingestion, um, so remember that some of these are um, found in products that are just not just the liquor cabinet. Um, these are found in mouthwashes and perfumes as well. Um, and again, you guys know what these kids look like, what these people look like. Um, nausea, vomiting, CNS depression, inhibition, slurred speech. Um, but remember, in kids, they can get hypothermic, but you need to remember hypoglycemia. Um, ethanol inhibits um, hepatic gluconeogenesis, so they come in with hypoglycemia. Uh, diagnosis is made with an ethanol level. Um, if, you, if you send that directly, um, you can also get clues if you calculate the osmolar gap. Um, that will be elevated. So this is one of those toxic alcohols. You'll have an osmolar gap greater than 10. Management, ABCs, IV fluids, treat their hypoglycemia, treat their hypothermia. We don't do activated charcoal for these, so none of the toxic alcohols. Um, <clears throat> and then just remember that um, ethanol ingestion or ethanol intoxication may mask other uh, co-ingestions, so you certainly want to evaluate for other co-ingestions. Methanol um, is found in lots of products in the home, like canned heat, windshield wa washer fluid. Um, the classic triad here is snowstorm blindness, metabolic acidosis, and GI symptoms, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting. That is classically a methanol ingestion. The diagnosis, you can send a methanol level. Again, you'll see an elevated uh, osmolar gap, especially early. You can see an elevated anion gap late. Management, no activated charcoal for these. Femepazole is the antidote. Um, it prevents the formation of formic acid, which is the toxic metabolite of methanol. Um, you can treat acidosis with sodium bicarb. Um, we can use leucovorin as well. You usually think about that with like methotrexate toxicity, um, but that actually can help metabolize that um, formic acid directly. Um, hemodialysis, if they have significant visual impairment, a resistant metabolic acidosis, or their methanol levels are incredibly high. Ethylene glycol <clears throat> found in radiator fluid, antifreeze, and coolants. It's a lot like methanol. Um, the, it's the metabolites that are toxic. Um, you'll also see an early osmolar gap, an anion gap late. These look like ethanol ingestions. So these are you know, um, kids who come in with disinhibition, nausea, vomiting, slurred speech, et cetera. Um, but they have a normal ethanol level. 
Um, so they look like they're intoxicated or inebriated, but their ethanol level is normal. The other thing that's specific to ethylene glycol um, is this hypocalcemia. You'll get these calcium oxalate crystals in the urine that fluorescine, and that is pathognomonic. Um, so remember that one as well. Diagnosis, again, profound metabolic acidosis, early increased osmolar gap, anion gap late, um, and then you can fluorescein their urine to see these calcium oxalate crystals. Uh, ABCs, uh, we do not uh, decontaminate their GI system. Um, we'll treat their metabolic acidosis with sodium bicarb. The antidote is fomepazole again, um, which blocks the uh, metabolism into these toxic um, metabolites. Uh, hemodialysis um, for severe symptoms. Um, and again, just remember the kid who looks intoxicated but has a normal ethanol level. Next question, a five-year-old presents with altered behavior, somnolence, and disinhibition. Which of the following would support a diagnosis of a toxic alcohol ingestion? A normal osmolar gap, alkalosis, urine you can fluorescein, or hyperglycemia? All right, very good. Very good. So normal osmolar gap is um, incorrect. You have an elevated osmolar gap greater than 10. Alkalosis is incorrect. You get an acidosis. So these are the M's and the E's on mud piles. That's your methanol, ethylene glycol. Um, hyperglycemia is incorrect. Um, you get hypoglycemia. And so urine you can fluorescein is correct. Um, ethylene glycol causes these calcium oxalate crystals in your urine that you can fluorescein. All right, organophosphates. Um, these are insecticides, herbicides, but then also know that these are the nerve agents. So when you hear about a sarin gas exposure, these are organophosphates. Um, they inhibit acetylcholinesterase, leading to a um, significant increase in acetylcholine. Um, again, this is your dumbbells, um, leaky, secretiony kids, and remember the killer bees, bronchorrhea, bronchospasm, and bradycardia. You can also get these nicotinic effects, um, so that's your muscular effects, twitching, um, but then also weakness, and particularly weakness of your respiratory muscles. Um, you can send off an RBC cholinesterase activity. Um, that is not a real-time test, so that's not anything that's going to help you today. Um, but you can send it off if you have high index of suspicion. You can see prolonged QTC and elevated ST segments on an EKG. Um, please remember, if there is any concern for organophosphate um, exposure, everybody taking care of these patients needs to be in protective gear, okay, like full-on protective gear, and you need to decontaminate your patient. You need to take those clothes off. Like, they need to go through the shower, like the decon shower outside the ER. Um, these are highly, highly toxic. Um, ABCs, these may require intubation, particularly because of the pulmonary edema, um, but the antidote is atropine. It's lots and lots of atropine. You titrate it to effect, so you give it until their secretions start to dry up. Um, 2 p.m. is actually for the nicotinic symptoms. Um, out in the field, um, they actually have these as auto-injectors, um, but in the ER, with the two of them together. Um, but in the ER, um, it is just lots and lots of atropine. Esophageal foreign bodies, really quickly, you guys see these all the time. Um, kids six months to about three years. Coins are the most common. Um, there's three places they get stuck. The, esophage the upper esophageal sphincter is the most common, probably because that's the first one they come encounter with. Um, if they pass there, then it's the aortic arch, and then the lower esophageal sphincter. If they pass the lower esophageal sphincter, it's fairly safe to say that they will pass into the stomach and then pass um, without complications. These kids are often asymptomatic. We find these um, incidentally, occasionally. Um, but symptoms, drooling, dysphagia, choking, gagging, vomiting. Um, some will complain that their neck hurts if they feel it right here. Um, you really want to think about these in kids, especially like the crawler kids and the young toddlers who have acute onset um, of respiratory symptoms or acute onset of, I don't want to eat or drink anything. Um, we can diagnose these radio-opaque ones by chest x-ray. Um, so if it's in the esophagus, particularly coins, you will see flat on the AP, and you'll see the edge on the lateral. The reverse is true if it's in the trachea. Um, for radiolucent things like food products, um, apple slices, whatever, um, you have to have a high index of suspicion. You can get an esophagram or endoscopy or consider a CT. 
The gold standard is endoscopic removal. Um, so they go into the OR and they take these out. Um, some, if they've passed, um, you know, at least that upper esophageal sphincter, um, you can consider observation and repeating these x-rays. So if we get a kid from an outside hospital that has a foreign body they're transferring to us, we will always repeat that x-ray just to see if it's passed, um, if particularly if they're asymptomatic. If they're symptomatic at all, they go immediately. Button batteries are sort of a different beast. Um, they secrete an alkali material, um, and that alkali material does exactly what the corrosives do. Um, it causes deep and severe um, um, burning, um, that liquefaction necrosis. You can get mucosal injury within an hour and full thickness burning within four. Um, these will classically show up as a double ring on an x-ray, so you can actually see, you know, there's an outer ring and an inner ring here, and you'll see this double ring on an x-ray. That's a button battery. You have a similar set of urgency if it's in the nose or the ear canal, but if it's passed into the stomach, then you treat it like any other foreign body. Um, and you just observe. Magnets are kind of a new problem as well, these tiny little magnets. If it's just a single magnet, you treat it like any other foreign body. If it's multiple magnets, the concern is that these guys can attract across layers of bowel. Um, so here in this picture here, A, um, this is in the operating room, and there was a segment of jejunum and ileum that were attracted to each other and formed a spontaneous fistula. This was a segment that was removed and two magnets had attracted across each other and caused, like you can see, sort of pressure necrosis here and here. So again, single man magnet, you manage conservatively. If it's multiple magnets, um, if it's in the stomach, you really want to go get it. If it's past the stomach and they're completely asymptomatic, you can consider observing them um, you know, for a short period of time to make sure that they have passed. Um, otherwise, you've got to go get these because they can cause problems. So we are going to talk about um, rabies, some bites and stings, and then we'll finish up talking about injuries um, and wrap up talking about child abuse. Um, so we'll start with rabies. Um, rabies is a virus that is spread through the saliva of infected animals. Um, globally, dogs are actually the greatest carrier um, or the greatest host. Here in the United States, it's actually bats. So less than 5% are dogs, and most of those are stray, unvaccinated dogs that actually become infected um, from rabid wildlife. Um, the reason that everybody gets so um, worked up about rabies um, is because it is almost exclusively lethal. Um, there are very, very few reported cases of survivors. In 2000, and I think it was 15, 2015, um, there was only one reported case in the United States. Um, there were three total, but two were contracted internationally, diagnosed here um, in the United States. There was one um, case in the United States. So regardless of the fact that um, it's so rare, um, it is so deadly um, that we take it incredibly seriously. So again, major carriers, bats, raccoon skunks, and foxes, less common dogs and cats, and then not usually squirrels, rabbits, or rats. Um, we want to define what a bat exposure is because it's not just, you know, you happen to see one flying by. Um, so obviously a bite um, exposure to fluids. So if you're in a cave um, that has a lot of bats, um, those are high-risk exposures. Um, if you're found sleeping in a room with a bat, so like you slept with your windows open um, and a bat flew in, you wake up and there's a bat in your room, that is an exposure um, or a bat in any close proximity to a child. So what we talk about or what we're really dealing with in the emergency department um, is post-exposure prophylaxis, um, which is um, incredibly helpful, reduces the risk um, you know, to almost zero. Um, there are a handful of case reports of failure of post-exposure prophylaxis, but in retrospect, almost all of them were due to like medical mismanagement. Um, so if there's an exposure, you first want to contact the health department. If it's a domestic animal, they'll observe them. Um, and um, if they're not ill, then they are released back. At any point they become ill, um, they'll euthanize them and actually test directly for rabies, which is like a brain biopsy sample. If it's in a wild animal, they'll euthanize the animal um, and test for rabies. Uh, in the emergency department or in the office, um, we will give the rabies immunoglobulin. You want to give as much as possible into the bite site. Um, so you inject as much as possible into the bite, and then you give the remainder intramuscularly. 
Then there's four doses of vaccines. The first is on day zero, which is the day of presentation, and then three, seven, and 14. We're going to talk about two types of snake bites. Um, this is like my least favorite thing on the planet, and I literally can't even look at these pictures because I get hives. Um, so there's two types of snakes that um, we want to talk about. One are crotalids, or otherwise known as pit vipers, and the other ones are coral snakes. So uh, pit vipers are things like rattlesnakes, cotton, um, cotton mouse, and copperheads. Um, if you felt so inspired to look closely at them, um, they have a triangular head, elliptical eyes, and there's a pit between the nose, which is where the name pit viper comes from. 25% of these bites are actually dry bites, so they'll, um, you'll see puncture wounds, but there's no venom that's injected. Um, but what you need to remember about pit vipers is that they cause coagulopathy. So that's what you need to know. They'll get a metallic taste in their mouth, and um, mortality is from coagulopathy. Um, you'll see ecchymosis, hemorrhage, oozing, systemic coagulopathy. Children are particularly sensitive because if you will um, think about the snake for two seconds, they don't really care how big the person they're biting is. They inject the same amount of venom regardless. So the small kid gets the same amount as um, you know, a grown man, and so children are particularly susceptible. The other ones are coral snakes. This is so gross. Um, sorry, it's horrifying. Um, so what you want to remember is red touches yellow, kills a fellow. Red touches black, venom black. It actually is somewhat fascinating because this is sort of in you know, nature's way. These non-venomous snakes, um, I'm going to try to do this without looking, like these guys over here, um, are things like milk snakes. They have actually morphed to look like coral snakes as a protective mechanism, um, but they are not venomous at all. Coral snakes are neurotoxic, so that's what you need to know about coral snakes. Um, you get paralysis and respiratory failure from coral snakes. So pit vipers um, are, cause coagulopathy. Coral snakes cause neurotoxicity. These symptoms can be delayed um, 12 to 24 hours, so anybody um, with particularly a coral snake um, bite, but really any bite, needs to be admitted um, for at least 12 to 24 hours for observation because these symptoms can develop after the fact. Um, so you, I want to identify the species of snake. It's literally my worst nightmare as an ER doctor that somebody would bring the snake into the ER. I swear to y'all, I have nightmares about this. Um, you want to immobilize the extremity and apply wound pressure. What you do not want to do is put ice. That just causes thermal trauma. You definitely don't want to cut and suck out the venom, um, nor do you want to apply a tourniquet. Um, so those are all contraindicated in snake bites. Once you get to the emergency department, it's IV access, um, a CBC and coag specifically for crotalids, um, and then pain medication and updating the tetanus. Antivenom um, is really based on the severity of bite. So um, if it is just puncture wounds but no other symptoms, um, there's no redness, there's no swelling, um, they have normal labs, um, you do not need to give antivenom just because they were bit. Um, but certainly if there's swelling that specifically extends beyond a joint, if they have abnormal labs or if they have any systemic symptoms, um, these kids get antivenom. Next question. Four children are brought in for treatment of snake bites following the failure of the pit viper pen door lock at the zoo. <sighs> um, which child should be given antivenom? The child with no visible signs but crying from trauma. Uh, swelling localized to the forearm. Swelling localized to the fingertip or thrombocytopenia. Exactly. Um, child A is appropriately traumatized but does not need um, antivenom. Um, if you have just localized swelling, um, again, you can observe that as long as it's not extended beyond a joint. The same for the fingertip, even though um, that's a little bit of a tricky one just because you think that that's a little bit more of a sensitive area. Um, but thrombocytopenia would be systemic signs of a pit viper bite. Spider bites, um, these are often confused with MRSA, so it's a common chief complaint for a kid that comes in with cellulitis. So I think they got bit by a spider. Um, that's actually pretty unusual. Um, there's really two, out of the thousands of types of spiders, there's really two that um, are actually venomous. The black widow, um, which has this um, little hourglass situation here, and that venom is neurotoxic. Um, and a brown recluse, 
um, and these, um, this toxin will um, lyse cell walls. So black widows, um, again, pain around the site, but these are neurotoxic, so they get muscle crampings, fasciculations, chest tightness, vomiting, sweating. They can get pretty severe abdominal pain. These kids actually can uh, um, mimic an acute abdomen and hypertension. Um, management, largely supportive, pain control, benzos, um, antivenom, there's spider antivenom in some severe cases, um, but generally this resolves in about 24 to 48 hours. What you need to know about brown recluse is that these ulcerate. So think about the U in recluse for the U in ulcer. Um, that can help you differentiate. Um, and the other one um, with brown recluses is the stem of the question will often give you something like the kid was playing in the back of the coat closet or the kid was playing up in the attic and then comes back with this like red bite that ulcerates. That's a brown recluse bite. You can have some systemic symptoms, fevers, chills. Um, they usually get admitted for pain control and wound care. Just some general tips on lacerations. Um, you know, I, I know you guys see these a lot. Um, we've all had enough experience with them, but just some general tips. Um, irrigation, um, you want to clean these out, just mild pressure. Um, consider um, updating tetanus and the tetanus immunoglobulin, particularly if they're under-vaccinated. You want to avoid skin glue on the scalp and then any bites. Um, bite wounds have high risk of infection, so you don't want to glue those. And then you want to avoid let gel, which is that lidocaine, epinephrine, and tetracaine on periphery. So tips of fingers, tips of nose, um, tips of the penis. Um, you don't want to give, it's the epinephrine component. You don't want to cause vasoconstriction in the periphery. Um, some lacks to think about that you may want to be more conservative with or consider referral, um, certainly eyelid lacerations, complex um, vermilion border lacerations, something called a fight bite, so that is um, a clenched fist. Um, you punch somebody in the mouth, and then you get a bite mark on your hand. That's called a fight bite. Those have really high risk um, or high likelihood of infection, um, so you really want to consider referral to hand with those. And then any lacks that have high risk for complications, so tendon lacks, um, anything with vascular involvement, um, certainly anything that's already infected or risk for infection, limited flexibility, limited mobility, or cosmetic areas. So, you know, hands and face, but then also if they're at risk for keloid formation. Puncture wounds are, um, you know, a little bit different than just plain lacerations. These are, you know, kind of more deep into the tissue, and you want to think about these a little differently because they have higher risk for infection. Um, so same irrigation, um, but you really want to um, explore these if at all possible. Sometimes you even have to get an x-ray to evaluate for deep foreign body, and we usually don't close these um, because they're high risk for infection. Again, update tetanus. The nail through the shoe, it's usually staph or strep, but you really need to consider pseudomonas, um, especially in the one that's not getting better. Antibiotic prophylaxis, um, generally not, you know, across the board, not indicated. Um, there's not a whole lot of literature to support one way or the other, but we do want to prophylax high-risk things. Um, so certainly bites, um, dog bites, cat bites, human bites, um, and then, you know, puncture wounds that, you know, look contaminated, anything through a shoe, certainly retain foreign body, increases the risk of infection um, or any patient with immunodeficiency. Burns are the number two cause of unintentional pediatric death. Um, they're not just fire, um, you know, thermal burns, but also electrical burns and chemical burns. 20% of burns in patients are child abuse. So we really need to have a high index of suspicion um, when we see a patient with a burn. Again, another area for great advocacy, um, we really need to recommend um, you know, safety in the home, keeping matches out of reach, keep those electrical plugs covered, um, and then the big one is the water heaters. We need to keep those temperatures set low. Suspicious burns, these are the ones we need to look for. Um, these are the ones that need to raise red flags. So pattern burns, um, you know, you'll see like a, a shape of an iron, um, a curling iron, or any grid-like burn. Small circular burns are cigarette burns. Um, a stocking glove distribution, so a hand or foot that was completely submerged into hot water, you'll see a whole hand. There's some areas that are generally protected um, from burns like the perineum and the buttocks, so if you see those, those are very concerning. 
ABCs, um, always, um, you know, particularly if there's any um, concern for, um, you know, burn around the airway, early intubation for these, um, but removing clothing, um, wash off any chemicals. Generally speaking, we're just going to cover these with a clean, dry sheet. If it's really small, you can put like a wet um, four by four over it, um, but these kids are at risk of hypothermia. Um, so if it's big burns, definitely don't do that, just a clean, dry sheet. There's four classifications of burns. Um, the first one is um, just a sunburn. Um, so these are first degree burns. These are superficial thickness, just think sunburn. Um, they hurt, you can have some swelling. These resolve on their own after about a week. A second degree burn, there's really two. Those are divided into two, superficial and deep. But really what you just need to know is that if there's a blister, that's a second degree burn. Um, so if it blisters, it's second degree. A third degree burn, um, what you need to know here is that these are painless. This burn has gone through um, and burned out the pain fibers, so these don't hurt anymore. Um, these will require grafting um, to heal. A fourth degree burn, which I don't have a picture of here, um, is a third degree burn that then um, extends into the deep tissue. So now you've burnt out your muscle, your tendons, your bones. There are three different graphs, um, or three different ways to calculate body the body surface area of burns. Um, you really only kind of need to know about two. One is the rule of nines, um, and that is for older kids and adults. So that's like the head and neck are nine, each upper extremity is nine, the chest and abdomen are 18, so nine and nine, um, the back is 18, and each lower extremity is 18. The perineum is 1%. So that is for older kids and um, adults. For the little bitties, um, generally less than nine, you think about their palm. So the palm of their hand, not yours, their hand is about 1%. So you can kind of use their palm to gauge um, the percentage. In between, it's some super complicated thing um, that I have to look up all the time. Um, for minor burn care, first degree burns, it's really just pain control. And second degree burns are not real different. Um, you want to clean with soap and water, debride any particularly large or painful blisters, um, antibiotic cream like silver sulfidine or bacitracin. The only thing about um, silver sulfidine is that it can leave like a silvery dark residue, so you don't want to use that on the hands or the face. Um, bacitracin is fine there. Um, daily dressing changes, pain control, and updating tetanus. Major burn care, so kids with significant burns um, need much more aggressive therapy. Um, again, ABCs. Um, think about carbon monoxide exposure or cyanide exposure if they're coming from a house fire. Um, the Parkland burn formula, you just got to know. Um, four mLs per kilo times the body surface area. And what you do with that number, you take all that amount of fluid and you divide it in half. The first half you give over eight hours and the second half you give over the remaining 16 hours. You still have to add in their daily fluid, the maintenance fluids right on top of that. Um, pain control, update tetanus. Um, when do we refer these? Any burns over 10% of the body surface area, those need to be referred to a specialty burn center. Um, full thickness burns, um, so third degree burns that are greater than 2% need to be referred to a burn center. Um, any inhalation injury um, or cosmetics, so burns of hands or feet, face, perineum, also things that cross over a joint um, or are circumferential because as those um, heal, they will scar down and you can have limited um, range of motion, so those need subspecialty care. Um, also complicated burns would need referral too. Electrical burns, um, we don't tend to see a lot in kids um, because the ones that occur at home are generally not as severe as the ones that occur um, in adults. So most adult burns are or electrical burns are occupational. Kids usually are home. Um, there's two types of current, so AC and DC. AC is worse. So DC, what happens is there'll be this large... Um, um, pulse of energy, you get a, a single contraction, and it actually throws you away from the source. Um, so like the kid on Jurassic Park, who was like climbing the fence, and they turned the electricity off, and he like shot 30 feet, like that would be a DC um, 
current. So AC, they have um, like cyclic electron flow, and so it will hold you on with tetany, um, and you get repeated and uh, sustained exposure, which is why AC is worse. So low voltage burns are considered anything less than 500 volts. Um, just for a point of reference, most household electricity is about 110 volts, like really um, high electrical appliances, maybe 240. Um, in contrast, like industrial and high tension um, power lines are greater than 100,000 volts. Um, so low voltage, dry electrical burns, really these kids are usually asymptomatic. They don't even often require evaluation. It's just minor cleansing and antibiotic cream. Um, you do need to know about the extension cord bites. So if a kid chomps down on an extension cord, they can get burns to their oral commissures. But the question that I've seen lots um, in practice um, is what happens later. So what happens later is that that SR falls off and their labial artery will bleed. So they'll get bleeding one to three weeks out from the labial artery when that SR falls off. High voltage burns, so anything over 500 volts, um, these kids need to be... Um, evaluated and they really need to be admitted. The reason is that you can have significant internal trauma and damage even if the outside looks fine. You may only see a tiny entrance wound, um, but they can have significant internal damage, um, per, um, particularly um, deep muscle injury. So um, the, the muscle breaks down. You can have all kinds of electrolyte abnormalities, but they get rhabdo um, and renal failure, certainly um, cardiac dysrhythmias, um, chest wall tetany, fractures um, from being you know, either thrown or the tetany. Um, uh, treatment, IV fluids, um, monitor electrolytes, telemetry, monitor EKGs, um, and treat for rhabdo. Next question. Multiple children are brought in from a house fire. Which of the following children require transfer to a burn unit? Is it A, the 15-year-old with second-degree burns to upper thighs? Is it the 2-year-old with first-degree burns over the torso? 5-year-old with no burns but with carbon monoxide toxicity? Or is it D, the six-year-old with 5% second-degree burns on their hands? Yeah, good, good. Um, I think A is a little bit tricky. Um, because if you apply the rule of nines, you could probably get close to 10% with that. Um, but D is the better answer. Um, so if you just have second degree burns, um, you need to have greater than 10% second degree burns. So that's probably why A is wrong. Um, B, uh, first degree burns would not require referral. Um, C is no burns, but carbon monoxide toxicity. That would not require referral. Um, but the 5%, it's the second degree burns. It's because it's the hands. Um, so hands are a cosmetic and a functional area. So those get referred to subspecialty centers. Um, a quick word on when we would refer to ophthalmology. Um, so again, just like with caustic ingest ingestions, alkali burns are the worst. Um, with a mild acidic or alkali burn, um, you can get some corneal erosion, but with significant ones, you can actually get complete opacification of the cornea. Um, a treatment in the ER is really just irrigation, copious, copious irrigation until you get that pH back down to normal. Um, we would also refer metallic foreign bodies um, in the cornea and lacerations of the lacrimal duct, lid margin, or tarsal plates. So we're going to talk about drowning um, for a minute. Um, drowning is actually the leading cause of death worldwide for boys between 5 and 14. In the United States, it's a leading cause of injury um, for 1 to 4-year-olds. So any source of water, it's not just swimming pools, it's not just bathtubs, um, lakes, streams, any source of water kids can drown in. Um, about 40% of them are less than five years old. There is a predominant male ratio, three to one up to six to one. 50% of adolescent drownings are alcohol related and seizure disorder increases your risk of drowning 13 fold. Again, another great opportunity for safety talks and for advocacy in our well child checks. Um, you want to have a surrounding standalone fence, self locking gates, or, I'm sorry, self locking door, and a gate that locks, um, a pool alarm, a pool cover, and none of that ever um, is a substitute for direct 
supervision. We're going to talk about pathophysiology, but I kind of want to mention two definitions first. So we tend to call it near drowning, um, but I think that they're, the better term um, is actually submersion injury. Um, near drowning sort of makes it sound like they either drown or they don't, and that's not really true. Submersion injuries sort of suggests that there is more of a spectrum from mild to severe injury with both fatal and non-fatal outcomes. The other thing is this dry drowning topic. Um, dry drowning is a word in the medical literature, um, and what that refers to is um, um, people that have post-mortem um, uh, assessments and that after a drowning event, their lungs are found to be dry. Um, that was originally felt to be due to laryngospasm, primarily like a laryngospasm, and then they maybe died from airway obstruction, or they thought maybe there was some catastrophic cardiovascular event, and they died before they drowned. So either their lungs were dry, or they filled up after, um, they, filled up after they died, if that makes sense. The dry drowning that we hear about in um, like social media and these, rep these case reports that come up on the news are a little bit different. Those refer to um, a kid who had some submersion injury, um, likely very mild because they completely recovered. And then days to weeks later, they develop um, rapid um, decompensation um, with no preceding symptoms, um, and they die, and then it becomes related back to this um, submersion injury that happened weeks later. That, that probably is not accurate. Um, um, what we know about the pathophysiology suggests that that is highly unlikely. Um, so we see patients all the time. Um, these reports every year circulate um, in social media, um, and parents will you know, have this heightened sense of concern that their kid got splashed in the face with a garden hose or went under for two seconds, and they're worried about this dry drowning. And so we need to be able to counsel them and explain to them how that is not necessarily related. That's different than the dry drowning turn we have in medical literature, if that makes any sense. What we do know is that patients um, who drown follow a very sort of predictable course of symptoms. Um, some amount of water is aspirated into the mouth, into the hypopharynx. Um, you have reflexive coughing. Um, there is a conscious um, effort to hold your breath. You can only do that for about a minute or so. And then there's an overwhelming inspiratory drive um, where you will take a big deep breath in regardless of how hard you try to not. You'll get laryngospasm, um, which eventually um, is resolved as the brain becomes more hypoxic. And hypoxia leads to loss of consciousness, which leads to apnea, which leads to cardiovascular collapse. Um, and that is the pathophysiology of drowning. Um, and we know that even the respiratory, or I'm sorry, the, the cardiovascular symptoms precedes something like tachycardia, bradycardia, PEA, asystole. Um, and that entire process takes three to five minutes um, at the most. Um, we have to remember that when patients are brought into the emergency department, regardless of where they are um, along that spectrum, um, there can be concurrent injuries, both C-spine injuries um, or head injuries, uh, intoxication in the adolescent patients, and then hypothermia. These kids get cold. Most of the mortality is due from cerebral edema. So hypoxic ischemic injury leads to cerebral edema. And even in the kids that are resuscitated, um, this often is where the mortality is 6 to 12 to 24 hours later. There's really not any difference between salt and freshwater drownings. There's Theoretical difference in cold water drownings, and that's really ice water drownings, and the theory goes that that entire cascade takes a little bit longer, sometimes up to an hour, so there is a greater opportunity for rescue and resuscitation, and there have been some greater case or some case reports that because of the decreased metabolic demand of the brain tissue when it's frozen, um, almost, that there is a chance for some intact recovery. Um, ABCs, um, always um, remember to protect the C-spine. Vomiting is common in these kids. They often drink a lot of this water as well. So if you're going to intubate them, it's rapid sequence intubation, cricoid pressure, um, consider an NG to decompress the belly, um, and then these kids get cold. Um, so either passive rewarming or active rewarming. If they're completely asymptomatic, so if this is a very mild submersion injury, they have a normal exam, um, normal chest x-ray, normal oxygen 
oxygen saturations, you can discharge these kids after about a period of six hours. If they are symptomatic at any point, they get admitted. Um, Next is head injuries. Um, this is probably one of the most common chief complaints that we see in the ER, probably because it runs the spectrum of ages. So we see it from you know, the little bitties who roll off the changing table and toddlers who are learning how to walk and the teenagers who are playing contact sports. The vast majority are not serious, but our job is to figure out who needs to be evaluated. Um, so some, of cons some concerning physical findings, what would um, prompt you to refer these patients, things that we need to worry about. Um, any abnormal GCS, um, pupillary changes, Cushing's triad, which would clearly be a late finding, um, bradycardia, hypertension, and irregular respirations. Papilledema would not show up immediately, and that's something that develops later, so excluding papilledema does not exclude serious head injury. Um, and then certainly you need to have high index of suspicion in infants, so um, obviously if they have retinal hemorrhages, that is classic for abuse. If they have other bruises or any concurrent injury, that is concerning. Um, be real careful of any non-frontal scalp swelling. So non-frontal scalp swelling we don't worry about. Parietal, occipital, temporal scalp swelling um, is concerning always. Um, and then you want to palpate for any step-offs. So who needs imaging? Um, who, that, that is the question in the ER, is who needs to get imaged? What we use right now um, is this study that came out, um, Cooperman's group, um, that came out of Lancet in 2009. Um, the PCARN is a network of hospitals, so it's a multi-center um, study that they do lots of pediatric research. Um, it's the Pediatric Emergency Care Applied Research Network, and they came out with uh, these low-risk clinical decision-making tools. Um, Right now, these are the gold standard for evaluations. They're doing um, studies ongoing um, to uh, validate these, um, but right now, this is what we have and this is what we use. These are criteria you kind of just need to know. Um, you can look them up. Um, um, they're very easy to look up. You can even like do some check boxes online and it'll sort of give you the risk. Um, but these are really things you need to know. They stratified these kids into less than two and old, two and older. A less than two-year-old with normal mental status, no non-frontal um, hematoma, no evidence of skull fracture, so that would be a step off, no loss of consciousness or just a brief loss of consciousness, less than five seconds, no high-risk mechanism. Um, the big one is the, the fall from three feet. Um, the rest of these kind of make sense. We, real, we would recognize these as high risk. And then normal behavior. Mom says they're acting fine. If in the absence of all of those, those are all normal, these kids have a less than 0.02% chance of a clinically significant head injury. And we would say at that point that the risk of radiation exposure is greater than the risk of missing a head injury. For greater than two, um, normal mental status, no vomiting, no signs of basal or skull fracture, no loss of consciousness, no high-risk mechanism, and no headache, they have less than a 0.05% chance. So also incredible incredibly low. This is the suggested CT algorithm. Um, again, the, the top one um, up here, A, is for the kids less than two. Down here, B, is for the kids two and older. And in both of these, the primary decision-making, the first decision-making step is do they have altered mental status or do they have a palpable skull fracture? So can you feel, I don't know where that, there, um, can you feel a skull fracture here? Um, do they have any signs of particularly basal skull fracture in the older kids? If it's yes, they recommend a CT. If it's no, then depending on the remainder of those um, questions is whether or not we just say no CT or we consider a period of observation. So here's our qu next question. An 18-month-old fell approximately four feet off the back of a chair onto a carpeted surface. She cried immediately and had no loss of consciousness. She's had no vomiting, is acting normally. She has a hematoma to her forehead, but the remainder of her exam is normal. What is the best course of management? Immediate discharge to home, CT head non-contrast, observation in the ED, or surgical consultation? Exactly. 
Um, so A, immediate discharge to home is not correct because she technically met a high-risk mechanism criteria. She fell four feet, which is greater than three feet, so she warrants a period of observation. Um, CT head not contrast. We would not choose that initially um, because she has no altered GCS and she has no palpable signs of skull fracture. Um, that would be our first choice, so, so B is not correct. Um, C is observation. That is correct um, because of the mechanism, but the remainder of the questions are normal. And D, surgical consultation, not yet. We don't know that she has any evidence of injury. So what are some common serious head injuries that we look for? Um, a basal or skull fracture would be one of them. Um, these are raccoon eyes, aptly named. Um, and you can see post-auricular bruising, so bruising back here behind the ears. Um, those are signs of basal or skull fractures. Temporal bone fractures, you can see bleeding from the ear. Hemotympanum, so if you ever hear us sort of call out in trauma, no hemotympanum, that's exactly what we're looking for. CSF, otorrhea, and hearing loss. Epidural hematomas, this is hemorrhage into the space between the dura and the bone, the calva calvaria, and it comes from a tear in the middle meningeal artery. Um, this is caused by usually direct trauma um, or some severe mechanism of trauma, a fall from a significant height, um, an MVA, direct blow to the area. These are less common, I would not say zero, but less common um, in non-accidental trauma. The classic one with these epidural hematomas, y'all, is um, that lucid interval. Um, so they hit their head, they seem like they're okay, and they have some pretty rapid deterioration. That's an epidural. On the CT, you see this biconvex mass that shifts the brain away. It does not cross suture lines, so you'll see it isolated um, between sort of one um, part of the skull. Um, the goal um, of management, I mean, ABCs as always, but then you're really trying to maintain cerebral perfusion pressure. You really want to make sure that you get blood to that healthy, viable part of the brain. Um, so you can elevate the head of the bed to decrease some pressure. You certainly want to maintain normal blood pressure. You do not want to allow for hypotension. Hyperventilating, um, the idea behind that is by blowing off some CO2, you cause vasoconstriction in the vessels in the brain, which may make a little bit more space up in the box <laughs> for the brain tissue. Um, we do do prophylactic anti-epileptics um, um, for these patients, regardless of whether or not they're seizing, and then mannitol or 3% saline, um, and this, these kids need to go to the operating room. Uh, a subdural hematoma is hemorrhage into a potential space between the dura and the arachnoid membrane. Um, these are what we think about classically with non-accidental trauma. Um, so you need to have a high index of suspicion um, for these patients. You can get them from falls and MBAs and other direct trauma, but classic, the, the, the concern is always non-accidental trauma. Um, symptoms are headache, vomiting, lethargy, irritability, seizures. Um, sometimes it's just the fussy kid, um, the baby who's just persistently fussy. Um, on CT, we'll see the concave um, mass, and it can cross suture lines. So if you remember, the epidural hematoma was really confined to one small space. This is not. This spreads kind of everywhere. Um, management is much the same as epidurals, so ABCs and treat their intracranial pressure, so treat their ICPs. Concussions, um, so concussions are um, diagnosed, it, it's a clinical diagnosis. There's not an imaging test for a concussion. These are kids who have head injuries who are symptomatic, but they didn't bleed. Um, they don't have any surgical um, or traumatic injury. Um, they, they are just really persistently symptomatic from their head injury, and they, any of, they can have any or all of these symptoms. Um, you do not have to have a loss of consciousness to be diagnosed with a concussion. Um, these kids have headache, nausea, vomiting, dizziness. They're unsteady. They're confused. They're disoriented. They can have slurred speech, photosensitivity, phonosensitivity, um, inattentiveness. There is something called a SCAT tool. It's a sports concussion assessment tool. Generally, these are done for athletes sort of in real time who have a head injury in the game. They'll evaluate them on the sidelines um, to determine whether or not they're ready to go back. And I also imagine um, that these can be used um, sort of to track progression um, as an outpatient. Indications for ER department evaluation, kind of some of the same things that we've talked about. So you've got a prolonged um, loss of consciousness, um, any concern for a concurrent C-spine injury, any risk for an intracranial breed, evidence of skull fracture, um, they have an altered GCS, 
um, if they've had a post-concussive seizure, um, or if they're just getting worse. They're getting worse and not better. We should see them in the ER. We need to counsel patients about the second impact syndrome. Um, you know, a lot of the kids, especially the athletes, are very excited to go back to sports, and, and this is why we try to make sure that they are healthy before they go back. Um, if they have another head injury before they recover from their first, it can cause loss of autoregulation of cerebral blood flow, and then they have increased risk for increased intracranial pressure with subsequent concussions. When are they ready to go back? Um, well, first they have to go back to school. So you don't get to go play football until you're back at school. And you're back at school full time without medication. So each one of these steps, they need to be symptom free, medication free before they're allowed to progress to the next. Um, so first they go back to school. We make sure that they you know, aren't having symptoms, that their exam is normal. And then activity return is just very gradual. You don't go straight back to playing full contact football. Um, you start with some light exercise and progress. All right, guys, we're going to talk about some musculoskeletal injuries and some fractures in particular, and, and then we'll um, wrap up talking about child abuse. We're almost done. Um, so growth plate fractures, we uh, use the Salter-Harris classification for these, and that just refers to where the fracture is in relation to the growth plate. The acronym for this is Salter. Um, so that should help. Um, so a Salter Harris 1, um, you see your growth plate right here, and that is just a slight separation of your growth plate. A Salter Harris 2, this is above, so it goes through your growth plate and then into the metaphysis. A Salter Harris 3 goes through your growth plate and then lower, so that uh, L is lower um, distally into the epiphysis. Four is when you have a fracture through both. So you've got a fracture in the metaphysis and the epiphysis. And then five, R, is when um, they get rammed together. Um, they get sh smushed together. Salter Harris 1 and 5 are real hard to see on x-ray. So a Salter Harris 1 is actually considered um, an occult fracture. If you've got a kid who comes in and he says, it hurts here, and they're point tender over their growth plate, and you get an x-ray and it's normal, you cannot exclude a Salter-Harris-1 fracture. So you have to treat these clinically like a Salter-Harris-1 fracture um, and splint them and refer them either to ortho or follow them up in a week with a repeat x-ray um, to evaluate for healing. Um, fives are similar. Um, if you don't see a growth plate at all, you're just not sure if their growth plate is closed or if it actually just got smushed together. You can actually figure that out by then just x-raying the opposite side. Um, and if that growth plate is open and this one's smashed, then this is probably a Salter-Harris-1. Five. Salter Harris twos are the most common. Um, threes and fours do need consultation to ortho because those are considered unstable fractures. Um, a green stick fracture is this. Um, so it's when the fracture does not go through both cortex. So you can see here that the fracture extends here through this, this cortex of the bone here, but not through this cortex here. So the fractured cortex is the tension side. You'll get this plastic deformity or this bowing almost of the compression side. A torus fracture is also called a buckle fracture. <clears throat> Those are increase, um, incredibly common. That's that typical fall on outstretched arm. So these kids will fall on outstretched arm, they hurt right here, and this is what's considered a buckle fracture. We don't even um, cast these anymore. You can actually just do like a removable volar splint for these, um, and these heal real well on their own um, just with a few weeks of immobilization. You'll make sure you guys see it here so you can see how this comes down, and then it gets like smushed out like a little sandwich kind of. So that's the, that's the buckle fracture. A spiral fracture is a twisting fracture along a long bone. There are two important things you need to know about spiral fractures. So a spiral fracture in the tibia of a toddler who walks, so like a little walking toddler, those are so common they're actually called toddler's fractures. Those are not child abuse. The toddler's fractures are common and those are normal. The kid is walking and then just sort of trips and falls and twists and falls down. Um, we see those all the time. However, spiral fractures in any non-ambulatory child, so an infant or a kid who doesn't walk yet, or a spiral fracture in the femur, those are always concerning for child abuse. So if it's a walking toddler with a tibia spiral fracture, those are normal. Anything else is concerning for child abuse, so you need to keep um, non-accidental trauma in mind. 
Distal humerus fractures are um, probably the most common fracture of the elbow. Um, you can get those from fall on outstretched arms. You also get them as like a hyperextension injury. Um, what you're looking for, so there's three types of supracondylars, um, but what you need to know about is this. So if you're looking here along this posterior cortex of the humerus, the cortex looks fine, but this fat pad that you see right here, that is always pathologic. You'll see that. Um, that is never normal. So if you have a posterior fat pad um, right here on this elbow x-ray, um, that is another example of an occult fracture. That is a type 1 supracondylar. Condylar. So these kids get splinted as well. The type 3s, which separate completely, um, so if you're looking at it on the lateral and the bone looks like this, um, those are very, very high risk for neurovascular compromise. Um, and so you need to make sure the kid who comes in with significant elbow swelling, um, that you make sure that they've got a radial pulse, they can wiggle their fingers, um, they're not numb, um, because any of those symptoms would would be indication for an emergent um, uh, open reduction in the operating room, okay? Clavicle shoulder injuries, um, common as well. Um, kids that just kind of fall on their shoulder side um, this way, they break their clavicles um, a lot. Um, you can see these from birth trauma, um, but these aren't often the ones we're evaluating in the emergency department. Um, consider brachial plexus injuries in these. Um, so you want to check their neurovascular status. Um, unless they're open or they're severe tenting where you really think that the clavicle is about to pop through the skin, most of these are treated as an outpatient. Um, the other one you need to look for is if you get an x-ray and there's a big Z fragment, which is just like when the two pieces overlap significantly, those may require surgery, um, but the vast majority of the times these clavicle fractures heal really well. You put them in a sling, and if you've got a fancy sling, it's called a swath that'll wrap around their belly. If not, you can just use an ace wrap um, and put them in a sling and ace wrap it to their belly. Um, and these will heal um, without um, surgical intervention. Fracture complications we need to be aware of. Neurovascular compromises really with those um, supracondylars. So the bad type threes, um, those have high risk. And then um, compartment syndrome. The common place you're going to see that is with tibia fractures. Um, you get swelling, but you can't that, that compartment just doesn't expand as well as other ones do. So you'll get swelling um, and vascular injury, and that leads to um, decreased blood flow to the tissue. The classic exam for these are patients with pain out of proportion to their fracture. Um, they may still have a normal pulse, um, but those are urgent orthopedic consultations. Those often require fasciotomies. Um, and occult fractures we've talked about briefly. So the main ones to think about are the Salter-Harris type 1 um, and these uh, ones with the posterior pat pad. As a general rule, um, you know, if the kid has persistent pain, um, you know, or the kid had just injured themselves, they come in, their x-ray is normal, or they're having persistent pain, um, it is safe to treat these like a fracture and follow up in seven days. Sometimes they just don't show up right away. Um, so it's always better to be a little bit more conservative than not. All right, next question. A child presents with significant pain to the elbow following a fall. There is no fracture per the radiograph, but there is a small fat pad behind the joint. What is the appropriate management? Splint and repeat x-rays in seven to 10 days, cast for four weeks, discharge with reassurance, or admit for compartment checks. Exactly. Splint and repeat x-rays in seven to 10 days. So if you um, see a fat pad, a posterior fat pad, um, that is the classic type one supracondylar, um, and those are never normal. We would not cast for four weeks just yet. Um, we tend to be cautious about casting initially. If the patient comes in swollen, and we cast them, and their swelling improves, then all of a sudden they're rattling around in a cast that doesn't fit. Um, if they are not yet maximally swollen, um, we cast them and they still have swelling to do, then they swell inside their cast and can have um, decreased perfusion. Um, so we don't typically cast initially. Um, we would not discharge with reassurance, and um, that is a occult fracture. Um, and we would not admit for compartment checks, and um, that's not a typical place that you see compartment syndrome, and they don't give you anything in the stem um, to suggest that you would be worried about compartment syndrome. Um, a quick word about sprains. Um, so sprains are ligaments, 
um, injury to ligaments around a joint when that joint is forced to move in um, an unnatural position. As a general rule, little kids don't strain and sprain. Little kids, particularly prepubertal kids, um, they fracture. So their ligaments and tendons are stronger than their growth plates. So if they twist and fall, they're going to fracture. They're not going to sprain. Um, it, that is unusual. As a general rule, kids fracture. Um, when they do sprain, um, ankle and fingers are the most common. Wrists and elbows are less common. Those fracture more often than they sprain. Physical exam, they have tenderness. Um, they can have swelling and bruising. The, diff the difference is that their tenderness is more diffuse. Um, generally speaking, when you have a fracture, you're point tender. You hurt where you are broken. Sprains and strains, a kid will say, like, it hurts here, um, kind of the all over hurts. That tends to be more sig um, suggestive of a strain or sprain. With ankle sprains, um, specifically, they're graded from mild to severe. We always want to get x-rays just to rule out fracture, but generally speaking, um, the management is just rice, rest, ice, compression, and elevation. Um, you may need to splint these or immobilize them just for comfort. Um, sometimes they need to be non-weight bearing for a day or two. Um, if they have really significant pain directly over their lateral malleolus, um, that, is, that could be a Salter Harris one as opposed to um, an ankle sprain. Radial head subluxations is my very favorite thing in all of pediatric emergency medicine. I love nursemaid's elbows so much. They're so much fun. Um, the parents usually think that they broke their kid's arm and everybody comes in upset and you fix it in like 30 seconds and you're a hero and it's great. Um, they're incredibly common, um, usually between two and three years old. The typical history is that mom um, is holding the kid's hand, um, like the little toddler's hand, and they trip and fall. And so mom reflexively like pulls up on their hand to keep them from falling, um, and they may or may not feel a pop, and then all of a sudden they don't want to use their arm. Um, they come in like this. Um, so if you don't see that, um, they hold their arms like this. So their elbow is flexed. Their arm is held in close to their body. Um, they are not um, swollen, and they're not particularly tender, but they get real mad at you when you try to move it. And that's your physical exam finding to suggest that these are supercondylars and not a fracture. You can palpate, start with the, the good arm first so they trust you, uh, palpate all up and down that arm, move to the affected arm, palpate all up and down that arm. If they're not swollen, if they don't hurt, but then they get real angry if you try to move it, that is very likely to be a supercondylar. The mechanism of injury is there's this annular ligament that holds in the head of the radius, and when they have this pull injury, that head of the radius gets pulled out of the annular ligament. Um, so you got to pop it back in. Um, there's really two methods to do that. Um, my f it really is de provider dependent. It's what you are most comfortable with. Um, I prefer the hyperpronation. Um, so you put pressure on the head of the radius, and you just hyperpronate their arm, and you'll feel a pop, and it'll pop right back in. Um, you walk out of the room, you come back with a popsicle in two minutes, and you're everybody's best friend. Um, you can supinate and flex, and that pops it in as well. Um, so some people prefer that method, and it really is just whatever um, you are most comfortable with. So the last topic is child abuse, um, and, and this just is not a lot of fun. Um, it is the worst part about a pediatric emergency medicine. I would probably argue it's probably the worst part about any of our jobs um, are these kids that we see. Um, but we are all mandated reporters, um, and so we all need to be aware of what these signs and symptoms and red flags are. Um, there are over 2 million reports per year of child abuse. Um, about 650,000 of them are substantiated. About 20% roughly are physical abuse. And on average, there's about 1,500 deaths per year. That comes out to four a day. That is staggering. Um, it is, incidence is secondary only to SIDS in babies less than six months. And we think that likely some of these um, SID deaths were probably um, abusive injuries, and the same with injuries to young children, one to five. Um, some accidents are likely related to abuse. Abuse is most typical in the home. Um, it's often by a trusted individual, and about 90% of the time, um, it's, an, it's a relative. There's three categories of risk. Um, there's risk related to the child, the abuser, and then environmental and systemic um, or system factors. Things with the kid um, or the child that makes them more likely to be a victim of abuse, um, sick kids, chronically sick kids, um, particularly um, babies with all the sequelae of prematurity. Um, these NICU graduates um, are at very high risk. 
um, but any child with chronic medical illness. Um, kids with developmental delay, intellectual disability, congenital abnormalities, um, just difficult kids, um, adopted children, and stepchildren are at increased risk as well. Um, risks of the abusers. Um, these are adults who were abused as a child. Um, about 30% of um, children who are abused go on to become abusive parents. These are adults with little social support, unstable family situations, young parents, parents with lots of kids, um, parents who are particularly argumentative or violent themselves, um, adults that lack emotional connection to the child, emotional immaturity, and then certainly alcohol and substance abuse and mental health. Some red flags for child abuse, some things that you should watch out for. Um, kids with new sleep disturbances, kids with appetite disturbances, certainly any regression, regression in toilet training, um, regression in developmental milestones, depression, poor self-image, problem with peer relations, kids who themselves are modeling aggressive behaviors, and certainly kids who are modeling sexual behaviors, either with peers or dolls um, or any other inanimate objects. In the history, um, if you see a kid um, who has delay of care, so mom comes in and said he broke his leg a week ago, and they're just now um, presenting for evaluation, that's concerning. Um, caretakers who have conflicting stories or changing stories is how the injury happened. Um, parents who just <clears throat> deny that trauma even happened, even though they're obviously injured. History that's inconsistent with physical findings. So um, a kid that's covered in bruises and mom's like, well, the dog jumped in the crib. Um, or uh, the history that's inconsistent with developmental stage. The classic one for this is the parents who say that the newborn rolled off the couch. Newborns don't roll. We all know that. And so they know they did not roll off the couch. Anytime the explanation is really vague um, or, again, inconsistent. Um, any injuries in non-ambulatory infants or children, particularly the ones under two. The ones over two can often tell you what happened, um, but any non-ambulatory infant and any child um, less than two, any injuries are concerning, but particularly long bone fractures, and um, like the spiral fractures we talked about, rib fractures, um, the posterior rib fractures in the little ones um, are from squeezing, um, and in the older children, it's just from direct trauma. Um, hollow viscous injury, so abdominal organ injury, um, any type of head injury. Injuries to multiple organ systems, injuries in multiple stages of healing, um, and particular areas are concerning, genitalia, non-bony areas like the ears, um, and then some sites are generally protected from injury, so trunk, face, the neck, the upper arms. You don't see that as much with accidental injury, um, so those sites of injuries are more concerning. And then pattern injuries, um, well-demarcated um, slap marks. You can see hands or just the outprints of fingers. Sometimes you'll see four little bruises like this. That's hands. Um, belt marks, loop marks, um, certainly um, any burns that are patterned um, or bites. Um, <clears throat> these type of fractures in particular, um, any type of skull fracture, um, humerus and femur fractures, again, the long bone fractures, um, posterior rib fractures, those are classic child abuse fractures. Um, also, bucket handle fractures, which are fr fractures of the, um, the corners of particularly like the tibia or the femur. Um, those are called bucket handle fractures or corner. Those are um, often what we're looking for um, in addition um, on skeletal surveys. And then any complex fracture because that suggests there's um, multiple vectors of force. Um, again, we've mentioned this briefly, but um, you know, inflicted things are generally on areas that are protected, so upper arms, trunks, versus accidental injuries. We all see the kids that run around with bruises on their shins or bony prominences like their funny bone, um, their forehead, their chin. Those are common for accidental injuries. Um, we talked about this in burns, um, but any pattern burned, um, so a pattern burn, a circular burn, um, this was probably um, from an iron um, here. Um, the stocking glove, when it is the entire hand um, or areas that are usually protected. Shaken baby syndrome um, is, um, is violent shaking of a newborn in a, or, or an infant that lacks head control. This is something that anybody who saw it, 
anybody who saw it would recognize it as dangerous or potentially lethal. Um, we had our oldest, um, our firstborn, we had one of the, he was super colicky, and we had one of these little bouncy chairs, and my husband was terrified to put him in one of these chairs because he thought he was going to get shaken baby. Um, and I had to very gently remind him that this was not going to cause shaken baby. Um, shaken baby is something that anybody would recognize as violent. Um, you have movement of this immature brain inside the skull, and they get tearing of the bridging vessels. And that's what causes those classic subdural hematomas and the classic retinal hemorrhages. These kids can show up with seizures, respiratory distress, or apnea, um, and again, just fussiness. Sometimes it's just fussiness. And the classic constellation is retinal hemorrhages, subdural hematomas, um, with little or no evidence of external trauma. The outcome for shaken baby is terrible. It's absolutely terrible. Um, on post-mortem assessment, um, we often find that these kids have evidence of lots of previous injuries. Um, so pre you know, cr intracranial injuries are um, the most common. Um, but early mortality for these babies, just from the initial trauma, um, is anywhere from 15 to 70, 25%, sorry, 15 to 25%. And the kids who do survive, about 80 to 90% of them um, have lifelong disability, um, some ranging mild, um, and some is incredibly um, severe. Some classic um, pictures so you know what you're looking for. Um, these here, so you can see this area of swelling here and here and here and here and here. Um, those are rib fractures. Those are all posterior rib fractures. Um, this is a subdural hematoma. Again, um, you can see sort of this large subdural hematoma here. You've got significant midline shift um, and you've got some soft tissue swelling. Uh, this is retinal hemorrhage. Um, so all of this um, blood should not be there. Um, and this is a, uh, a spiral fracture of the tibia. Um, this is in an infant. So this is a non-ambulatory child, um, which is why that this tibia fracture would be um, a red flag. So that's it, guys. Um, thank you all so very much for your time. Um, I really wish you the best of luck on boards. <laughs>